A pair of Jimmy Garoppolo's ex-teammates chiming in on Jimmy Garoppolo's time with the New England Patriots and maybe some irony about how his career ended with the San Francisco 49ers. Talk pass rush win rates, the strength of the San Francisco 49ers team. And I've got a question for Croc, and there's a question from a listener as well about the worst trades in NFL history that's on my mind right now. Are the 49ers potentially involved in that discussion? All that and more coming up right now you are locked on 49ers your daily san francisco 49ers podcast part of the locked on podcast network your team every day Welcome to Locked On 49ers. Brian Peacock and Eric Crocker with you at BD Peacock at Eric underscore Crocker. I am Brian Peacock, NFL analyst, co-host of the Locked On. No, the co-host of the Peacock and Williamson NFL show. You can find it on YouTube on the Locked On NFL channel, though. And I'm with my co-host, Eric Crocker, former NFL and AFL player, Arena Bowl champion, and the co-host of Locked On NFL Draft right here on the Locked On Podcast Network. Your team every day. Thanks for making us your first listen we've actually got surprisingly a lot to talk about on today's show croc for it being late june and not much going on there's still a little bit of a news cycle trickling in and out of the nfl i want to start with uh, some of jimmy garoppolo's ex-teammates that uh, we're talking about jimmy's time with new england and really some choice words from martellus bennett but i mean jimmy garoppolo wouldn't be the first person that martellus bennett talk trash about right so it's almost like it doesn't mean anything if uh if if martellus bennett's saying something bad about you right it's, it's almost like he's like a leaky faucet where you just stop hearing it because he's always got something negative to say about somebody <laughs> never afraid to to say anything um but i think that's the best way to put it right there where he, yeah he just he just speaks his mind and sometimes yeah. i feel like you need those type of people that oh yeah you're not gonna sugarcoat anything you're gonna you're gonna know exactly how he feels with on any topic he's not gonna play to the media he's not gonna play to any public uh pressure or anything like that like you are going to know 100 percent how he feels does it come off disingenuous sometimes though and i get i feel this way sometimes with draymond green too and it's like you like talking so much it's like you don't even really care about this subject do you you just you're talking about it because you like to talk and being a little over dramatic with things and i get that feeling about martel's Bennett. it's like i don't think he really even cares about it he probably forgot what he said after he even said it i get that feeling sometimes with some of these guys i think that a lot of us feel like when we're talking in public we have to speak a certain way but when you're talking to like your close homies you're talking to your brother you speak a different way and yeah. I think he speaks like how he speaks to his brother. He speaks to everyone that same way. But you know, it's funny. There's a lot of things you say are just throwaway comments that you don't even mean and you don't care about because they're nothing <laughs> you know, you're not being recorded. And if someone brought it up to you the next week, say, hey, look at your comments on paper. Read your quote. And be like, I didn't say that. Did I say that? I didn't really care. <laughs> you know, having drinks, talking mess or whatever, you know. Uh, but so anyway. Julian Edelman was asked about Martellus Bennett's comments on the, uh, it was the I'm Athlete podcast, right? That's where this came from. And so, first of all, the Bennett, my, Martellus Bennett, former New England Patriot, he called Jimmy G a B word. He said that you can't win with a quarterback like that, essentially. And he was calling <laughs> out Jimmy G for, he was calling out Jimmy G for not playing through an injury when they were with the Patriots. And well, hold on real quick too. We, we, we have yeah. to, it, this, that like back and forth, like those comments are from a previous podcast from a while ago. Like it might've even yeah. been a year ago. Martell has been, it was talking about it with someone. I think it was, I think it's maybe a Jason McCourty it was, or yeah, one it was of the, the McCourty brothers. brothers. Yeah. Yeah. They have their podcast, podcast and he was just, called. He was letting it all out there. So right. the I Am Athlete was just with Edelman, and they were asking him about the comments because Brandon Marshall, he likes to do some messy stuff a little bit, and he just had <laughs> Edelman read the quote. So so go ahead. Sorry to cut you off. Yeah, no, thank you for prefacing that. This is like uh, podcast inception. So our podcast talking about a podcast that was talking about another podcast. So the Martellus Bennett co comments were old. They came from the McCordy's podcast. I'm not sure what their podcast is called. And then Martellus Bennett's 
quote about Jimmy G was shown recently on the I Am Athlete podcast. Uh, Brandon Marshall handed Julian Edelman a piece of paper that had Martellus Bennett's full quote, and he reads Martellus Bennett's quote and then commented on the same situation because obviously he was in the same huddle and in, 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 on the same team. And, um, and, and Julian Edelman kind of backed up Martellus Bennett's comments about Jimmy G. And he said that he got mad about Jimmy G sitting out a game with a, with an injury to his non-throwing shoulder and, and that maybe they lost a game because of it, because um, Jacoby Brissett played instead and Jacoby Brissett had a bad thumb. And so basically they, they, they questioned Jimmy Garoppolo's, manhood right they they questioned his motivation and said he probably could have played essentially and that they were upset that he wasn't willing to play through it and they said basically that it was something that was agent driven and he was trying to get paid and and get paid by a different team potentially and he was looking out for himself rather than the team well also with what Bennett said you know it was if you weren't going to play let us know on Thursday Right, and that was part of the quote. Like, if you knew you weren't going to play, and your agent didn't want you to play because of your shoulder or whatever, let us know Thursday so that Brissett can practice all week long and get those much-needed first-team reps, so that you can potentially go into a game and win, or at least give yourself the best chance to win. But when the day of the game comes, and now they feel like it's agent-driven with you not going out there and playing, and you were the guy that was getting the first-team reps all week. And now Brissett, who does have a bad thumb, now he has to play. That's when you're the B word, right? Because like, we're, like the Patriots have a certain standard, and their expectations are sky high every single time they go out there. The expectations are to win, and everyone is on the same page with that. So when that's the expectations of everyone, and they're preparing all week to do that, and then all of a sudden you're preparing with them, but then it's like, oh no, I'm not gonna play, and they know it's probably because of your agent. I can understand how you would feel a certain way, especially with other guys like Edelman said. Dude, I played with broken ribs and all this, that, and the other, going out there for the cause of the win, and you didn't do it. And again, I don't think that's the bigger issue. I think the bigger issue is just tell us on Thursday. Let us know on Wednesday that you can't go or you're not going to play through this injury. But when you go out there and now we're expecting you to be out there to give us the best chance to win, and you've been practicing all week, then all of a sudden you're like, eh, I'm not going to do it. Then yeah, I, I would feel some type of way about that as well. And obviously, we don't have Jimmy G's side of the story on that. He would probably tell you that it was a game time decision. Everybody knew about it. Bill Belichick should have had a backup, better backup plan, knowing that Jimmy G might not be able to play. Uh, I, I don't know. I, I don't know what Jimmy G would say about that. But the quote: the from players Colton, are all on the same page. Well, I don't want to say all. We've only heard from two players. Those two, but those two players are definitely on the same page with how they viewed that situation. So if they are, and Edelman said too. There were a lot of players in that locker room that felt a certain way about that, including him. So yep. what's circulating in the locker room about that is probably more so how Martellus Bennett feels. He just says it in a different way than anyone else would. And Julie Edelman, Julian Edelman did say that the quote from him was that he would, he did get mad about it at the time. And he he said, quote, I can understand why Marty thinks like that when he read the quote about Martellus Bennett saying you can't win with that kind of quarterback. And what's interesting about all of that um, – is that that is not the Jimmy G we saw in San Francisco, right? And the irony of all of it is that if Jimmy would have taken himself out with a bad shoulder, maybe right now he's better off for it and would be a starting quarterback, would have gotten paid from another team, would have gotten traded away, and his situation would have been better if he would have held himself out. But he actually played through the pain and played through the injuries, right? So it's he like played through act- his injury and Brissett's injury. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and with both the same injuries, the shoulder and the, and the thumb, which is insane. And he played through both of them, got him to the NFC Championship game, and now is paying the price for it. He's probably going to make less this year and, and might not even have a starting job because of it. So that is wild, the irony of the Jimmy G we saw with the 49ers and what they're talking about that season in New England. And how he's viewed by the 49er locker room, as far as what we know. Now, I did see someone say, yeah, that's how the 49er players are talking about it now. How will they talk about it in three, four years or 10 years from now when guys aren't, are no longer on that roster and they're away and they can speak on this situation freely? But the way that is coming out from the players right now feels very genuine with how they feel about Jimmy Garoppolo, which was ultimate leader, tough as nails. They'd do anything and go to war with this guy. 
And he has gotten that respect from his teammates by his actions. Yep, absolutely. But a so, lot of them have come out and said, like, he's played through things that he had no business trying to play. Yeah, you know? right. I think I heard uh, uh, Trent Williams talking about his, you know, ankle or something like that, snapping. And, I mean, Jimmy, Jimmy's tough. I think that's the one thing where, you know, we could talk about, like, what are Jimmy Garoppolo's elite traits? Well, one, great leader. Two, he is tough as nails. And it was definitely a business decision back in New England. But again, I don't think they're upset by the business decision in the sense of him sitting out. It's the timing of him telling everyone that he's sitting out. Yeah, it, that, that was, Martellus Bennett actually said that. He said he didn't have a problem with the business decision side of it. it. He was mad about the timing of it. About the, you know, not being Thursday that he took himself out. It was a game time decision. Yeah, thing. so now you're the B word. Right, yeah. So, But it's, in, it, it's so wild to hear the exact opposite of what you think about the guy and maybe he learned from that. Maybe he was like, I can't, that was dumb. I can't do that. That was a B move. Right. And now I've got to be somebody else when he became Because he could have, I mean, we knew what was going on this offseason. He, he knew this was his last year with the San Francisco oh, 49ers. He, he would have made it all the sense in the world if he, if he held himself out. And, and there was times I thought Kyle Shanahan should have held him out for him. And it would have been better for the team even maybe. Maybe this is when the backup could have played better. Like that beginning of the Rams games, like they screwed up. They let him play. Oh my gosh, this is a disaster. And then they ended up coming back <laughs> in the game, you know? So uh, just Isn't it wild. crazy how that whole thing changed? Because that first half, all oh, up and down my timeline, get him out. He's terrible. He can't play. The thumb is an issue. And then second half is like, pew, pew, pew. he's throwing BBs all over. And 49ers, you know, leads them to victory, game-winning drives, game-tying drives, going to overtime, all this great stuff. And if he would have got pulled at halftime there, oh, man, like, how would people talk about him then? Now, I also did see someone talk about 2020, and there were people that felt like Jimmy could have played and just did not. You remember that? He had, the, he had the ankle injury, and there were a lot of people that were like, he could play. He he elected not to, and Kyle Shanahan, you know, was upset about that. Yeah, I don't know how true that is. We haven't heard a whole we, lot. We got to pause on that. Let's continue that conversation. I got a couple of questions that pertain to 49ers quarterbacks as well in the hopper, and we talk a little bit about the 49ers pass rush. Got some good stats on that coming up. But uh, first, we got to let the folks out there know about Bet Online. Bet Online is your number one source for everything sports wagering and betting needs this season find all the latest sports developments league reviews and news including this year's well the nhl NHL finals are now over we got major league baseball we've got a golf two different leagues to wager on now uh professionally and and obviously there's uh, other leagues as well beyond the pga and the live tour mma boxing and how about celebrity boxing? Did you see this croc today? <laughs> they signed the deal. It's going to be Le'Veon Bell against Adrian Peterson. NFL running back versus NFL running back. Maybe they saw the way Frank Gore uh, uh, got a little payday with his post-career boxing, and they went and wanted in on that action. And right now, the 30-year-old Le'Veon Bell is the favorite over the 37-year-old Adrian Peterson. I don't know why. Uh, they're both 6'1", 30 years old for Bell, 225, uh, listed at 217 for Adrian Peterson. Obviously, the seven years might matter, but um, as was uh, as was said here in this email that I got that had the, the odds, anybody who's shaken Adrian Peterson's hand would probably put their money on Adrian Peterson. Uh, he's got powerful hands, at least. So that's an interesting one. I might take the underdog in this one just because you don't know what to expect. What do you think, Peterson or Bell Crock? Hey, we can put money in together. I'll give you a little money, you know. Okay. We can, we can go in on this. Split All day? He's, I, I mean, I think he's going to be – I think I think he's got the right mentality to be a boxer, too. I, I, he's not going to go down. But I, I'm, I'm all about Adrian Peterson in this one. All right, so that's that's done deal. Let's go bet on the underdog. Adrian Peterson against Le'Veon Bell. That's supposed to happen in July. Neither player is officially retired, by the way, from the NFL, from what I remember. But you can find those odds, NFL Futures – news reviews live betting esports scores and more get over to bet online today use your desktop or mobile device to learn more about the trends in action at bet online where the game starts
Thanks again, everybody, for making Locked On 49ers your first listen. Make sure you're all subscribed up to the YouTube channel. Check out the Locked On NFL YouTube channel, not only the Locked On NFL podcast, but also the Peacock and Williamson NFL podcast. Some big news to come with the Peacock and Williamson show uh, being spread out to even more uh, streaming platforms around the nation, which I'm excited about. More on that later, and you can check into the Peacock and Williamson show for that stuff uh croc you were just talking about in 2020 with the jimmy g injury and whether or not he could play and that there were some whispers and some folks that thought maybe he should be able to play but i remember seeing him play hurt and that was bad he looked worse playing on his injured ankle in 2020 than he did playing with his bad shoulder and thumb i think aside from the first half of the rams game um in in 2021 do you agree yeah yeah, it didn't look great didn't look great at all. And, you know, we watched that Dolphins game and passes were selling all over the place. Uh, maybe couldn't push off of his ankle or as uh, JTL Sullivan likes to say, you know, all 10 toes in the ground or all 10 cleats in the ground, whatever he says. But he wasn't doing that. And it seemed like kind of, you know, hampering a little bit or whatnot. I don't know. It was a weird situation. But I do believe that a lot of people felt like at some point he can come back. Right? At some point he, he can come back and I – when was that Seattle game where they say he had got another high ankle sprain or, or re-aggravated it or whatever? Uh, oh, so that yeah, was that the game where he got pulled mid-game? He got pulled mid-game in the Seattle yeah. game. Well, he got pulled mid-game against Miami, and then he got pulled mid-game as well against yeah. Seattle. And not even really mid I mean, it was like closer to fourth quarter than it was second quarter. And didn't, didn't Kyle Shanahan, or was it just people that were like saying that Kyle Shanahan – Maybe it was just like some anonymous reports or something that Kyle Shanahan wasn't even going to start Jimmy G, but he did because he was so worried about the direction the season was going and that maybe he's, he, he put him back in there when when maybe he shouldn't have, should have held him out in 2020. Yeah, I don't, it's tough because high ankle sprains, people come back from those. And matter of fact, quarterbacks, I've seen quarterbacks kind of play through some. Some have missed time. I believe it was Kyler Murray who – had a high ankle sprain last year, missed a few games. He did. He missed one of those with the 49ers when they got blew out with Cole McCoy playing quarterback. So you've seen that, but guys typically come back. Now, whether Jimmy re-aggravated or whatnot, I mean, how much longer would he miss? That's typically, for most skill position players, it's a four- to six-week injury. Quarterbacks, because they're not utilizing their mobility as much, typically can come back a little bit sooner than that. So to see him kind of go out, two different times and then just, oh, I'm just not coming back. And then you see George Kittle, who's like, listen, I don't care what's going on. I'm playing football. And I think that was the thing where George forced his way back on the field. Jimmy Garoppolo did not. And I think a lot of people took issue to that. A couple of things from listeners. One, Thad Allen asked the question, what was the last dominant quarterback performance you can remember from a Niners quarterback? What, what, was there a like a dominant performance you can remember from Jimmy Garoppolo? I think there's some like signature moments maybe, but you referenced uh, him throwing darts earlier. There was that, um, I like, I don't know if there, I like, I would probably to answer that question, go back to Kaepernick against like the Packers, right? I'd like to, just to find he it. He had that, a few dominant performances. Yeah. Jimmy's not the dominant type. I, mm-hmm. you know, and this is not a knock on him. I think he does well. I think that's why he's kind of viewed more as a quote unquote game manager because he's not necessarily going to create the explosive plays that in turn are viewed as a dominant performance. I think there are games that he played very well. There was a game against the Cardinals one year where he threw four touchdowns, zero interceptions. I believe it was on Halloween night. Because I was taking my kids trick-or-treating and watching the game on my phone at the same time. All right. But, um, you know, he played very well in that game. And I feel like he had some games like that. But when you watch Kaepernick, it was like, oh, oh whoa. Right? Like you were kind of blown away by. Yeah, where the other team just doesn't games. have an answer for one player on your team. Right. And, and Jimmy think, never had that. Jimmy right. has played very some games that are really good, though. And I think the league figured out the, the the pistol thing a little bit more, and I'm sure teams would defend Cap better than they did then. There was a little bit of a sneak attack to it as well with Kaepernick. But man, just with with everything they put together with some of those games, there were some. Those were the dominant. Those were the last dominant performances I can remember from Fort Nash. Well, and I wouldn't one, say that Jimmy G ever had one. One game that the fans referenced on social media was the Green Bay Week One game where Kaepernick threw for 400 yards. 
<laughs> and outdo uh, Aaron Rodgers in that. So we saw him outdo Aaron Rodgers three times. And when yeah. I say outdo, it was like he played better. It was like, okay, he's the guy. He looks like, not saying he's the best quarterback on the field, but he looked like in that moment, that's the better quarterback, right? So the game where he opened up in the playoffs with an, a pick six to start the game, and you forgot all about that because of how he played for the rest of the game, Thanks. right? Like yeah. he was lights out, broke a record, dominating performance. Played them again in the snow in Green Bay, and we got the chance to see Jimmy playing really cold weather snowy weather in green bay and we got a chance to see cap play in that really it was like sub-zero degree weather and cap's performance was pretty dominant some of the touchdown passes he threw some of the plays he made down the stretch with his legs to get them in field position and you watch him you know jimmy grubble it's like uh can we please block a punt and return it for a touchdown please can we please block a field goal so i think we just saw uh, cap in bigger moments play at really high levels and just definitely have more dominant performances than what we've seen from Jimmy who has played well and he has games where people are like man that was a really good game from Jimmy but uh it's hard to view them at the same level as what we saw from cap and I think that's what the 49ers are hoping to get like that caliber of quarterback where man we we won this game because our quarterback was able to be special in this moment I'm going to, I want to tease a question from a listener. And, and this question was in reference to a question that I asked on Twitter and that I also asked on the Peacock and Williamson NFL show. We spent the entire podcast Monday talking about if the Deshaun Watson trade is the worst trade in NFL history. And um, I, I'm actually going to save this one for tomorrow because I think it could be a little bit longer conversation, but there was a nomination for the 49ers trading up for Trey Lance in that. Um, and so uh, I think it'll take too long for today's pod. So I don't want to get to that question next, Real but quick, I want to get gotta, to you. Got to kick that nomination out. No, that's not the worst. The worst. Okay. I'm wait. I'm going I'm to hold off. Yeah, 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 hold on. I know what the worst trade is. And I feel like anyone else that knows any history on just terrible trades should know what trade I'm talking about. I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to hold off on it though. Right okay. Now. Hold off on it. And I want to put it out there to the listeners too, because I want some listener nominations for this question. We'll talk a little bit about this on Thursday because tomorrow we have Wink on. We're going to do the the finale for the all-time San Francisco 49ers franchise draft. Um, but I want to hear from the listeners. Hit me on Twitter, at PD Peacock, at Eric underscore Crocker, in the comments on YouTube. What is the worst trade in NFL history? What is the worst trade in 49ers history, too, for a little sub uh, sub question? I, I'm interested to hear some of those, and, and Croc and I will talk about that question a little bit on Thursday's show and i've got some other questions here might do a little um a little twitter thursday episode there uh for 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 some of those topics uh next croc let's talk about the 49ers pass rush let's let's stop talking about quarterbacks for today let's talk about the guys getting after those quarterbacks and i've got some interesting stats to show uh where the 49ers are at with their pass rush and, and where they could go this year and be even more dominant up front and i do want to thank everybody again for making Locked On 49ers, your first listen. And don't forget, for your second listen, check out everything going on on the Locked On Podcast Network, the Peacock and Williamson NFL Show, Locked On NFL Podcast. Make sure you're subscribed up to everything. Tell a friend. Let them know that your team is covered right here on the Locked On Podcast Network every single day. Oh, and of course, Locked On NFL Draft featuring my guy, Eric Crocker. All right, Croc. My co-host for Peacock and Williamson, Matt Williamson, former NFL scout. You might have read his work for a decade at ESPN. He was the godfather of ESPN podcasts. There used to be like one football podcast in the world, and it was the NFL Today podcast on ESPN that Matt Williamson was a part of way back, going way back in the early days of podcasting. Um, but he brought this statistic to my knowledge, and uh, I found it very interesting. The NFL's average blitz percentage last year was 25.4%. So about a quarter of snaps NFL defenses had some sort of blitz, some sort of extra pressure, some sort of fifth rusher coming at opposing teams' quarterbacks. The 49ers last year were well below that. They were one of the lowest teams in the league in blitz percentage. As we know, watching the 49ers, they like to try to bring pressure with four. That's part of their wide nine. It's part of that Chris Kosterik front. They try to come after you um, and and use pressure less than a lot of teams and they brought blitzes on just 19.8% of their 
snaps. But the 49ers were still fifth best in the league with 48 sacks. And looking at uh, pressure percentages, the 49ers were awesome. They got pressure on the average for the season, almost 35% of snaps they got pressure. And that's with bringing so little blitzes as well. 34.1% was their season-long pressure percentage. But from week 13 on, it was almost 50%. It was 45.7%. So those are insane pressure rates that the 49ers were bringing last year without bringing a bunch of extra blitzers and fifth rushers. But, Croc, the big thing I want to point to is that was last year's team that was doing this. And this year, they dra- they still spent their highest draft pick they had on Drake Jackson, a defensive end out of USC, right, with pick 61 overall. They brought in Kamoko Toure. They brought back... Um, who did they bring back? They brought back Kerry Hyder, Eric Armstead, full-time defensive tackle now. The sky's the limit. Like This is the unit that is going to carry the 49ers is that pass rush, and they have that good of a pass rush already and still put resources into that group. So I'm excited about what that front's going to look like when you got Abelcom and Drake Jackson and Kamoko Toure. They can have some really fresh speed coming off the edge opposite of Nick Bosa. And if Kinlaw is anywhere near the guy they hope they were drafting in the first round a couple of years ago, I mean, this defensive front could be just ridiculous. Maybe the best we've seen even since 29, even better than 2019 potentially. Uh, That'd be tough because you had a lot of D for it. Obviously Nick Bosa played out of his mind. You had DeForest Buckner. You had Eric Armstead who had double digit sacks as well. And, you know, D Ford who didn't miss an entire season or played more than the five snaps or whatever he played over the last year. So it'll be hard to beat out 2019 because the pass rush was so good, but they definitely can be good. They definitely can be pretty dominant. Uh, I like what they do. And I'm a big believer in put your resources towards that defensive line. It affects the quarterback so much. It affects the passing game so much. It moves quarterbacks off of their spots. It makes them throw the ball before they want to. They're just way less comfortable. It is wild that they were able to do that with such a low uh, blitz percentage. But man, it, you know, to throw, you know, Ture out there, uh, draft Jackson, obviously Abosa, get something out of Ken Law. You still have Armstead. And really a bunch of other guys that are kind of the unsung heroes on that defensive line. I mean, shoot, did we talk about uh, Sosa, uh, gosh, uh, Ebucom. And I mean, they they just have uh, Aminahu. They just have so many, I don't even want to just say bodies because it's so disrespectful for how well that group played last season. But to add more guys to the mix, tremendous. And I, I love it. There are a lot of people that are like, uh, 49ers, don't you draft a defensive lineman? And I, I'm at the point where it's like, no, keep drafting these guys because cornerback is extremely hard. Coverage in general is extremely hard. The more you can get after a quarterback, dude, those dominating performances they had in 2019, they were holding quarterbacks to less than 50 yards. They held Jared Goff in the season where he threw for like 4,500 yards or whatever he threw for. They held him to 50 passing yards. Baker Mayfield, less than 100 passing yards. They did it to like four or five quarterbacks that year. Like just dominating performances. I want more of that, even if that means you're spending a lot of high draft capital on that position. Did you see the PFF rankings about where the 49ers secondary, you know, not not pass coverage, but just their secondary. um, Basically, they were counting the top five DBs on a team, you know, both starting corners, both starting safeties and nickel, uh, nickelback. Did you see where PFF had them ranked? Yeah, was it uh, middle of the road, right? Like I think it was like, 15? yeah, little, even below that. Is it 18 or 19? I think it was, I think it was no, 18. It was, 15th. was it 15? Yeah, it was 15. I thought it was even lower. Might have been 15. Yeah. I'll look for it right now. I know uh, my guy Rich J. Madrid had posted it. So I think that's maybe where I saw it too because he was upset about it. Uh, 16. So yeah, they're smack down in the middle. Okay, so yeah, right in the middle, 16. Do you, do you think that's disrespectful, saying the 49ers are kind of middle of the road, secondary? Uh, I think that is good. Because if you are a middle of the road secondary alone, and you have an above average pass rush, that bumps your sec- secondary up to around top 10, as opposed to a team that has to lean on the secondary and doesn't have as great of a pass rush, you're going to be out there to dry, you can't cover forever, 
uh, quarterback is going to make more plays with his legs and then these off-scripted plays that cre uh, end up being explosive plays, 49ers aren't going to have to deal with that as much. So, okay, 16 by themselves, awesome. With the pass rush, definitely nearing top 10. Yeah, it's going to play up. And having the question mark of not knowing who the starting strong safety is going to be, um, not knowing about – and I, I don't fault them nationally necessarily for not knowing. Like, I think – I think I have a higher opinion, Croc, and maybe you probably have a higher opinion on someone like Emmanuel Mosley than maybe the national media because they might know the name. Or like, I mean, how good is he? He's probably just like whatever starter, but I think he's actually really good. Well, BFF um, should know that. They chart all these. Numbers I mean, they know, he but had like, numbers. there's just not a, not a lot of big name value there. And Jimmy Ward, I think we appreciate locally maybe more than than folks do nationally as well. We're like, oh, Jimmy Ward does so much for this defense, and he might grade out pretty well, but it's like, ah, it's not Mika Fitzpatrick, right? He doesn't have the big name to go along with it. You know, it was a first round pick. So uh, I don't think it's disrespectful well, he's not a big name at because all. He doesn't have the interceptions. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I think they have an opportunity to outplay a middle of the middle, middle tier secondary. They have the opportunity to do that, but yeah. they almost, they, they're almost assuredly to be a better coverage team than that because of the front and considering the linebackers too. So how much the linebackers help? How much range all three of the linebackers have that the, you know the 49ers can cover uh, at that level as well as any team in the league probably. If you were just looking at coverage linebackers, the 49ers are there. So um, it, it all points to the defense carrying this football team and a young quarterback with, with some question marks on what the offense is going to look like. I have a feeling the 49ers are going to lean on the running game and really hope that they can sort of uh, be good front runners and run with the lead if they get a lead in games. And and lean on that defense, lean on that pass rush to to really carry the unit. And and they've got to make sure that there's not like some huge holes or something in the secondary. I think that's what you know going to get in Charvarius Ward was all about. Uh, you know, I don't think people would say he's the best corner in the league, but they spend a lot of money on him, and they expect him to be a you know just a really good starter on one side. And I think they expect Mosley to be a really good starter on the other side. Who knows what we're going to get from Verrett. But if like, if there's just a gaping hole and you can't cover people at strong safety or can't cover people in the nickel, then maybe there might start to be a little bit of a, a problem. So that's where, that's where I'd kind of worry about, worry about it. And I think it's, it's pretty fair to rank him in the middle of the pack. Yeah. And they actually had Jason Verrett as the nickel listed as a nickel. And I just don't see that at all. Well, I never want to rule anything out, but he's never been a nickel. Corner. And I don't want him thumping people in the run game either. Right. I want him touched as less as least as possible. Get him out on the <laughs> perimeter. You know, I'd rather have Mosley come in there and, and play the nickel if they're going to do right. that. So that might actually, you know, how they had it listed, bump the 49 secondary up where I think whether it's, you know, whether they have Verrett out there or not, I think they are still kind of a middle of the road. Now they can be better. Like I said, if Hufunga comes out and he just plays well, uh, if whoever <laughs> plays nickel plays well, then I think they should be definitely, definitely above average secondary. But also, I was a guy that was kind of trying to give the secondary his flowers last season. I caught a lot of slack from that from 49er fans. But, mm -hmm. you know, I talked about how the pass rush can help. And people are like, well, they only play well because they had a good pass rush. Well, okay, like. Do you want to take away the pass rush from, from the secondary? Like, if they play well, they play well. If they're giving up the least amount of explosive plays, they're giving up the least amount of explosive plays, no matter how they're doing it. And they did it a lot last year with guys like Ambry Thomas having to play a ton and Josh Norman and Drake or Patrick and all these guys that they didn't want to have to play. And they still played well. Well enough. Now, there were a lot of penalties, a lot of them by Josh Norman, but they were able to get by and still, on paper, play well in the sense of passing yards against and all that other stuff. Yeah, and they don't, they're, the depth is good, too, to the point where they, at least at outside corner, they shouldn't, on paper, have to go to, you know, the Josh Normans of the world. They shouldn't have to throw, all of a sudden, Brian Allen off the street and start him at outside corner or something crazy like that, you know. Uh, so, obviously. Well, that's that, what you would hope. Yeah. But you got to remember last year, you know, heading into week two against Philadelphia Eagles, they were they were without their two starting outside cornerbacks. And that's but even tough. that happened. And, and my my issue with the the how people talked about the secondary is what NFL team is going to really get the production out of the secondary as the 49ers did when you're going into games 
without your top two cornerbacks. Like that's not even that, that, that it's not even realistic to expect this team to play above and beyond. And even then, they still limited the bleeding throughout the year. They were like sixth against the pass. And I think in, in a lot of that because of that pass rush. So that's why I'm so excited because their pass rush could be better. And I think their their secondary potentially on the outside could be better. Um, but even if they lost their top two guys, uh, you know, maybe they've got four draft picks from the last two years. Ambry Thomas, Samuel Womack, uh, you know, is is Vare going to be part of it? So the depth is there too, which I which I absolutely like. Safety depth, I'm absolutely worried about. But hey man, they always got Dante Johnson. Yeah, and Dante Johnson can just play anywhere. That's why he's definitely going to be on the team. I like it. I'd rather play Dante Johnson at this point than uh, than I don't know someone off the street, right? Than Josh Norman. For sure. Yeah. That was tough because Josh Norman just can't run anymore. Yeah. And so just the, the penalty flags, like you just can't give, you just can't keep giving teams a free set of downs plus 15 yards. Anyway. All right. Good stuff. Uh, that's a fun little conversation there. Where do you think the 49ers pass defense as a whole is going to rank this year? They have a chance to be really good. It's going to buoy the team for sure. I'm excited about how that unit comes together on defense in 2022 thanks for making locked on 49ers your first listen make sure you're checking out locked on nfl draft the peacock and williamson nfl show daily here on the network croc and i back tomorrow the finale of the all-time san francisco 49ers draft will team peacock ever draft a quarterback i might go quarterback this i don't know croc I'm not going to tell you what my uh what my plan is but uh, I can't wait for that one. And then we'll put it out to the listenership who has the best all time 49er squad team Peacock, team Crocker, or team Winkler. We'll finish that one up tomorrow, right here, locked on 49ers.